so our next and final speaker of the session is uh, Dr. Anupama. Uh, Dr. Anupama will be speaking about Asia's post-pandemic order and regional integration of ASEAN perspectives. And she is with Faculty of Arts and Science in Wien University in Hanoi. Floor is yours, Dr. Anupama, 15 minutes to you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Praveer. Uh, good evening to ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be able to speak today. Let me share the screen. Okay. I was told that I have eight to 12 minutes, so I'll try to stick to it. Uh, by the way, my paper is not about connectivity. Uh, by mistake, my name is added to this session. So, so today um, I'm going to speak about Asia's post-pandemic order and regional integration, selected ASEAN perspectives. I have arranged the presentation in simple questions. What, are, what it is, why, how, and who will do what is necessary. So to begin with, in this paper, I aim to provide a big picture perspective on uh, the specific ways in which integration processes or globalization is likely to or should change in the post-pandemic order. And that uh, with respect to ASEAN's characteristics, uh, participation in the production networks and its pandemic experiences, I would like to discuss the future course of integration in as ASEAN under specific themes. So why this is important? It is not for the first time that integration process or globalization is challenged. It's been happening for some time and uh, we are all aware of the gaps and loopholes in the integration processes. But this time, because of the severity in scale and impact of the pandemic, we have realized the seriousness of these loopholes, the complexities of integration and the institutional gaps in these process of integration. It is COVID-19 that has compelled governments, private actors, regional and international organizations, the general public to reconsider our understanding of the limits and approaches to integration. We are well aware of the immense benefits of integration. Poverty is reduced. Uh, countries like Vietnam, which were once agriculture-based, have turned themselves into export-based economies. Technology has traveled. Ideas have traveled as we integrated. Uh, countries where institutional reforms were there and robust technology spilled over. So we are... Uh, so integration has been beneficial. At the same time, we hear about the countries like Bangladesh, which uh, is an LDC and soon to be graduating from exiting from the group of LDCs because of the benefits drawn from integration, especially emerging as an export-based economy. So, now that we recognize and we face a huge catastrophic risk of connecting excessive dependence, that is COVID-19, the word is collectively called questioning, you know, how should we connect? How should we integrate? Should we change the process? Uh, and so on. This has raised many important policy questions and need to be urgently addressed. So how will post-pandemic integration will change. Here are some key themes. First one is deglobalization. It is certain that some form of deglobalization or reversing of integration to some degree will is inevitable in some countries perhaps, which could be in the form of localization of uh, suppliers, uh, reversing uh, supply chain or nationalization, regionalization of the way we uh, do business will definitely happen at least in the immediate uh, period, if not in the long term. 
there is one example which I came across in uh, DW source, which is about Sinofi, a French pharmaceutical company, which is an MNC. The company used to outsource basic ingredients required for pharmaceutical uh, industry to Asia, especially because of cost advantage. But today, now that supply chain is disrupted, this specific company is working on moving pro these processes to their own country and are anticipating Germany's subsidies so that they can do the entire process in their country. So this is an example how a big company like this was once, uh, and it still is, taking benefits of cost advantage is now contemplating nationalization or localization or maybe regionalization somewhere within Europe. And the second aspect is diversification of economic integration. Many countries across the globe have realized that the more concentrated sources of suppliers, the more the risk. So if, uh, in the years to come, Diversific uh, economic integration will be more diversified. Uh, and also, at the same time, it is likely that the supply chains will be shorter because the COVID time is also happening with other big changes, especially in the field of digital revolution, uh, digital transformation. We are seeing on-demand economy where consumers want to order and then want to have the product right away. So this, there are some examples about textile industry companies which want to be closer to the source of their raw materials. So that's second thing. And the third one is in the post-pandemic integration order, the role of state becomes more important. The reason being, we see that the, the the critical role that state has been pay, playing in many countries. Uh, several countries are going through a um, uh, layoff, uh, the reduction in uh, revenue, disruption of supply chain and so on. So the, in order to immediately respond and also to facilitate recovery process, it is important that government identifies vulnerable sectors when I say vulnerable, it could be labor intensive sectors or sectors that are deeply integrated and active in regional and global supply chains. The best example is textile industry when it comes to Asia or ASEAN for that matter. These are pictures from a local Vietnamese garment factory located about 30 kilometers from where I am. And uh, this, why these labor intensive uh, industries are important is uh, they uh, big chunk of population or uh, labor force is employed in these industries and whose livelihood is tied up with these uh, supply chains, textile exporting industry. So as you can see in this graph, Vietnam, uh, it, uh, about 24% of Vietnam's exports are concentrated in textiles and clothing, leather, footwear. And this, the figure, the same figure for Cambodia is as big as 76%. And for Indonesia, it is 11%. So we all know, we see these products made in Bangladesh, made in Vietnam, made in uh, Cambodia, India, China, and so forth. You know. So this is also an indication how severely these sectors are affected, how many people lost their jobs. And another important thing is this sector employs mostly women. It's another point that gender equality has uh, is affected significantly during the COVID-19. So this is one example that how government should play an uh, active role in identifying more vulnerable sectors and uh, helping them in the immediate uh, period and also for the recovery process and later to ensure resilience because these supply chains will go on. The next is uh, another example. 
This is actually an example from Vietnam. Normally countries when they vaccinate, the priority age group is uh, people who are elderly or uh, people who are, have another other set of underlying health conditions. Something unique I observed in Vietnam is they prioritize vaccinating industry workers. This is an interesting way of approaching because by doing this, there are a few benefits. One is the economy keeps going, the factories are going, uh, people earning uh, a livelihood is ensured. And the second one is these industries or factories located in special economic zone are quite densely populated. The, the company that I just showed you, the textile company, Ivy Moda, for example, has about thousands of workers sitting together and working. So this is also a way to identify risk, identify and then reduce it by vaccinating them on a priority basis. Here, age does not matter. All factory workers are prioritized. So in Vietnam, this is a priority group and which is a significant way a policy intervention in dealing with COVID-19. And uh, the second is supply chain laws. We have been hearing that many countries, uh, I would, again, I would like to emphasize textile industry because of Asia, the labor advantage, which is so important in the context of Asia and ASEAN. Uh, due to COVID, when supply chains were disrupted, companies right away canceled their orders. What happened to the people working, employed in these sectors, uh, we know as we see, uh, take the case of Bangladesh, which has several people employed in textiles. Textiles is the industry where exports are concentrated. According to The Economist, Asia alone employs about 43 million people in the textile industry. Clothing, uh, and when it comes to demand, clothing sales fell by about 73.5% in April in the US in 2020. And also Bangladesh lost about exports worth 3.5 billion within six months in 2020 from January to June. So that's the reason I'm mentioning is we should at the institutional level make supply chains resilient. And this is possible when we bring the supply chains on the legal framework, institutionalize it. Um, the fourth the fifth point is digital capacity building and transformation. This again, it's this industry is going to disrupt uh, industries in the future. And especially now, it's an irony that during COVID-19, many digital innovations are taking place. One because of urgency, inevitability, and the urgent need to cope with the damage uh, caused by uh, doing business otherwise. So, I again mentioned about the case of Ivy Moda because when COVID happened, Ivy Moda had to uh, get rid of, lay off some people and for a brief period, because Vietnamese economy to a certain extent is doing well within the country because of the way it's dealing with the COVID-19. So when it did that, uh, and at the same time, it started producing goods like like making masks and so on. They gave me a set of masks. You cannot wear them. They are just suffocating. The reason I'm mentioning this is the same Sinofi company, which also makes masks, it gets its uh, technology for producing healthy, uh, uh, sorry, high quality masks from Europe. The material to produce from Europe, but it only outsources for labor advantage. If this continues, when country big companies like this are thinking of nationalization or localization, some form of some degree of deglobalization, we should all also be thinking how long will the cheap labor advantage last? And if it does, in what sectors? It, this question is relevant not only because of COVID-19, but also because of technology. If we have these 3D printing and so on, which repetitively produces goods, eventually demand for labor-based intensive 
uh, tasks will come down. I make this point because we need to predict them. COVID-19, nobody knew that we are going to come into a phase like this where everything seems so stagnant. So that's another point. And I have a last two points. Okay. Uh, the last aspect is I would like to emphasize on ASEAN because the, the scope of this paper, I'm sticking to ASEAN. At the policy level, ASEAN should set a precedent on how integration will evolve in the post-pandemic Asia. The reason is the timing. This time is critical, important, and the impact of COVID-19 will be here for years. So ASEAN should uh, initiate bold coping strategies in terms of response, recovery, and resilience. The second one is ASEAN's vulnerability due to its active participation in the regional global supply chains and the dependency on labor. The region is vulnerable. Uh, a few catastrophic events like this are very hard to recover from. And the last one is ASEAN in, uh, in, uh, with respect to its vision, should think of approaching post-pandemic integration in its own way. You know, Vietnam has successfully or has displayed leadership qualities in uh, handling COVID-19 and because of which some, to some degree, domestically, Vietnam is doing well. It remembered lessons from the SARS experience it was aware of uh, the limited health infrastructure in advance, uh, the timely transparent communication to the industries, to the factories, general public, and so on. Proactive risk assessment, like identifying who should be vaccinated first. How do we do it? Even I came here on a work permit. The way they handled quarantine was amazing. I mean, country which is resource constrained because of this kind of policy efficiency is able to handle COVID-19, which many resource abundant countries could not do. And the last one is, uh, as a result, uh, Vietnam's informal economy, to a greater extent, still function, at least domestically. So the last thing I would like to propose for uh, and uh, argue for ASEAN is its institutional policy response. ASEAN should take this opportunity where we reflect deeply on the integration process, where we identify the policy loops and the loopholes, and take this opportunity to bridge all the gaps in the integration process and try to minimize the risks in the future, ASEAN should focus on resilience. Resilience at the national level by building maybe Ministry of Resilience, why not at the national level? Ministry of Industrial Resilience, and ASEAN should have a forum for resilience. Irrespective of what time we are going through, it is not only important to build industries, but also to ensure that they are resilient and, they, and then be able to uh, uh, forecast what is imminent in the future. It is not hard today based on data, evidence, trends, where we are heading, it's quite easy to uh, understand and act upon. And I suggest this because there were few other unprecedented responses to integration to, or to modernity in other countries like Britain or Japan, which have a minister for loneliness. Loneliness is also an affliction of modernity, of the way we are progressing. So, so why not we focus on resilience in a big, way is the point with which I want to end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anupama. Excellent, particularly the last slide. Uh, and good idea. Hope ASEAN countries will pick it up and uh, we will have more discussion you know, in, in coming days on this.